I got involved as a mobile DJ when I was 13 years old. So that's how it started for me, uh, for the mobile world. I'm 49 now, so I've been doing this for a couple of years. It changed from mobile DJ work to, I bought the equipment from the mobile DJ company and taught myself how to DJ and started doing school parties. And then it moved into playing in the nightclubs. And then it came into, why am I playing other people's music when I have ideas of music in my own head? And that to me was a transition in between traveling and just staying a local DJ in Philadelphia was music production. Because then all of a sudden people all over the world got to hear my things and then you didn't have to be from Philadelphia to know Josh Wink. So uh, production kind of opened up the door for me for uh, world travel and world recognition. The term mobile DJ came from a disc jockey who was mobile. It wasn't at a nightclub or a, a banquet hall. It was someone, a company, two people, one person, whatever it may be, that had their own equipment and did events, do entertainment. So I used to do weddings, bar mitzvahs, uh, communions, party events that weren't about nightclubbing. It was more for, I mean, you guys know what a wedding is. So if you don't have a live, a live band, you have a DJ. So that's kind of what I did. And I wasn't the sole DJ. I was an apprentice when I was 13. I would learn how to pack a car and plug in the equipment and understanding the business side of things. And there wasn't turntablism or that kind of DJing at the time. It wasn't about beat mixing, beat matching. It was about entertainment of playing the right songs at the right moment and requests. So when your grandma wants, you know, a slow song to dance with her son who's getting married, that's when I know when to play it. And it's solely about entertainment. There wasn't an artistic aspect of it at the time yet for me. The artistic part of DJing came about for me with hip hop music in Philadelphia and growing up and watching like Cash Money and Jazzy Jeff in the streets of Philadelphia and getting to see beat manipulation, beat juggling, transforming, you know, that the turntablism aspect of DJing. And then I got to go through the house music producers from Chicago and New York and there are artistry of blending and combining music and working certain things together. To really answer your question, yes. I really got to understand DJing from a different point of view than what it grew into. It's, in the beginning it was a form of entertainment of playing the right music at the right time for the sole purpose of entertaining everybody from four-year-old kids to 75-year-old grandparents and to 20-year-old people getting married. You're there to entertain them, that's what you get paid for. No questions asked. It's not about education. It's not about people at the wedding coming up and saying, what track are you playing? Certain aspects of mobile DJing is about entertainment. Now it's become into a hybrid of artistry and education and entertainment. How are you doing? <laughs> What's up, handsome? Uh, good question. I, I don't know. Probably uh, get a good lawyer. That's the one thing that I found out in this game is just I signed. I did a lot of learning 
most of my deep learning in life has been about weird, tumultuous, hard circumstances. And most of them in life have come through signing bad record deals. So I would say, <laughs> get a better lawyer. It's a good question, and it depends on the person that's answering the question. Because it's different. I'm an artist, you're an artist, everybody is unique. I ask myself, how can I not compromise my integrity to who I am as a person? So it's what you feel comfortable with. And that's what separates yourself from other people, is your individuality. There's a joke in the industry that there's always some guy at the front of the, of the nightclub or the DJ booth. It's always like, you know, play harder, play faster. And you don't play for one person. They're the loudest. But that doesn't mean they're, that they dictate what goes on. Musically, I don't know but I know it's going to become bigger. You know, one of the things in this industry is, that has happened is that it become popular and more in demand and more available. I think everything is kind of here to stay, but things that just mutate. I don't really get into the debate on what it should be, if it should be synced or non-synced, or if it should be analog or digital. I mean, I don't need to be right, so I don't, I don't fight that fight. <laughs> you know, if it sounds good, you know, think of your artist that you really, really, truly like, and you don't care how they make it, they just happy to be made it, right? I am a big fan and a friend of Apex Twin, and I don't care how he makes the music. I just want them to keep on doing it, you know? I mean, the technology's helped me out a lot, and it's also made me lazy. And I've also listened to old music and wondered, how do I make my current music sound like my old music? Because I miss that sound. I have a lot of my old gear, and I have my analog and hardware machines to go back to using 12-bit samplers and drum machine samplers and sequencers, and I don't use the computer anymore. Or I combine the two, I combine that world with the, the software world and see where it leads. I don't know, I'm, I'm not on the forefront anymore of breaking the newest things. I, in a short part of my career, I became someone that wanted the newest, freshest, plugins, gear, and that fizzled because it wasn't always about what I had, it was just what I had and how I used it rather than how new it was or something like that. There's a mixture in my world where I like simplicity for me. I don't like to travel the world with a lot of stuff. I like to be light, I like to be carry on. My setup is a mixture of computer and old school thought train of being. I use Tractor and I use CDJs with time control like I would with a turntable or a CD player. But I use my computer as my record crate. So I have my old school vinyl set up with like two turntables and a, and a mixer, but I combine it with the computer aspect of it. And for me, that's just fine. At times, I look at other artists and I get really inspired to go that route. I'm like, wow, that's really cool. Um, but it's not where my head is now. And there's a really good, open, growing community of us all who are into music and technology that are pushing the boundaries to what happens next.
I've just kind of got lost in my world of production and traveling and running a record label. Another question that's based on individuality. I don't make music on a laptop on the road. I mean, I have colleagues and friends of mine who do. For example, a good old friend of mine who's a very popular and very talented artist, yours born. He makes music on his laptop on flight. And he could be flying from Amsterdam to Delhi and do three tracks on his laptop and play on the gig and get the best reaction ever. That's him. I need to be in the studio when I make my music. So it's a mixture of touring the world as a DJ and being at home in the studio where I make music. I can tell, I get very inspired to make music at certain periods of time. And I'm excited to go in the studio and do them. And then next thing you know, it's not going anywhere. So creativity comes and ends and flows. I don't think there's any person on there that's always 100%. I go into the studio sometimes thinking that um, I'm going to do a techno track and then it comes out to be like, I know, a downtown boat house track. The unique energy flow of being an artist, being creative is unique to us. So I imagine that their writer's block will be gone. I don't know, I can't put my head around someone who's 23 years old and using sound banks and internet sound sharing sites, I don't know, these, where you just, it's kind of like GarageBand now, yeah. where there's these, you pay for a subscription service for sound and loops and textures and you just you cut and paste and splice it splice is a good one there's another one that native instruments does as well too so i work with a, a friend who uses that and it's really cool and fast but the homogeny of music nowadays comes because a lot of people are using the same presets and same sounds is a block for me but i can't think to answer the question right of a 23 year old that only knows this rather than me still making music through drum machines and one shots and sequencers and software sense and hardware sense that don't base themselves on preset sounds the question to answer the question is maybe get out of what is comfortable for you get out of your comfort zone and push yourself in a that shadow place where you don't feel comfortable and see what comes comes up and how it can be inspiring. Uh, mistakes turn out to be the best things in the world sometimes for me. So don't get too focused on what should be, rather what can be. You know, we should be outputting a certain amount of music, we should be doing this. My mom used to say to me, never shoot at yourself which I thought was a pretty funny thing to do, but you're, you're wasting your time and energy on something that you kind of is, is out of your control. So just control what you want. If it doesn't go the way, just strap it and move on and progress. If it doesn't work in general, then just go do something and get out of the studio. But uh, I think when you become too comfortable and lazy with things, things come a little bit uncomfortable as well. You know, the beautiful thing about me and making electronic music is that there's no rule. I can make a track, I can do a remix in a day, if it works and it flows and it's just going right. But then sometimes it doesn't work and I scrap it or I go back to it in a month or... You know, I did a remix for Sea Bug and Clay, which was uh, a track I did in 2017. They did a track for Rejected, which is yours once record company. Um, the track was called Come Together. And yours born did two remixes for open recordings and I owed him a remix. That's the beauty of being an independent uh, electronic musician and artist and record label is that you can call favors upon friends to do them at some time. So 
Fjord did a remix for me and then I owe him one and so this track was coming out on his label from Steve Bug, who's also an artist on Oh. So it all just worked out. They gave me the parts and three days later I gave him a finished product. They're like, oh shit. You, you did that so quick. And I said it just it just worked. So sometimes creativity comes easily, easily, without thought, it just flows. And then sometimes it's like banging your head against the wall. So I, I never know how long something's going to take. Do you end up scrapping a lot of tracks? I don't say scrapping, I say leave them how they are and then creatively find them in the future. And be like, wow, this is cool. And then I change the kick around or I change something and then it becomes something uniquely different. I know you're asking this question to me, but I can also make it for everybody as well. Um, creativity is spontaneous for me. But that being I don't make music on a laptop, I can't be at home and say, oh, I got something, I'm gonna be creative and write it down at home. For me to make music that you guys get to hear, I have to make time to go in the studio. And it's the balance of my life in between being a father and a family man, a record label guy, and a touring traveler guy that's able to fund what I do through doing gigs like this around the world. Um, I look forward to getting in the studio because that's my time to be 100% creative. And when I'm on the road, I miss it. But there has to be some sort of a balance for me in between. You know, there's a point in time when artists and DJs and uh, producers would make money from record sales. A lot of those days are over. You know, because there's only so much money, you, you get a tenth of a cent from it being streamed one time. So you have to have one track played 850,000 times to be able to make minimum wage. It's hard to do that when you're an underground artist and make a living. So any artist that makes music who wants to make a living has to go on the road and tour and sell tickets. And then you have to balance what got you there. Well, you guys know me because not I'm a DJ, but because of the, uh, of the artist I am and I, I have been over the past, you know, years since 1989 when the first record I had came out. So there has to be some boundaries and some regimen. Now, a regimen works uniquely with individuals. Uh, my ex-partner, King Britt, he made a schedule to be in the studio where he would work from nine until six. Like a job. That worked for him. May not work for you. Some people like to be in the studio at night. I like to work at night in the studio. There's no distractions, not people calling me on my phone very much, but I also like my sleep now. My son gets up at 6.30 every morning, so I'm up at six. So my night times are spent differently than they used to when I was a younger man. But it's uniquely, some people like the scheduling, some people don't. It's what works for you. Um, the reason why the aliases come out, or came out, believe it or not, was solely contractually, originally. I wanted to record on different labels that I really truly loved and wanted to be a part of growing up. Because I grew up in the, the beginning of this industry and there were really cool labels. As a DJ, I would always buy their music. And I used to say, if I was an artist, I want my music to be out on this label because I want that record that that label had. But I couldn't because the contracts back in the time said you exclusively would sign to this label as this name, so I changed my name. But originally the reason why the, the alias is was because I wanted to be on different labels, and that was the only workaround. In terms of me being and having alter egos, 
sometimes I, I, when I started these projects, I wanted to have a different outlet. Like I can make Acid House as this name and Techno as this name and Deep House under this name. I like that concept. That gives me the liberty and the freedom to do what I, I kind of want to do. It's kind of like Richie Hawn when he does his Plastic Man thing. You know, when you know it's Plastic Man, you know what he's getting, but it's all coming from the mind of Richie Hawn. But really kind of, to answer your question, the reason why it shows all those different analysts is just contractually, I wanted to be on different labels and that was the only way to go ahead and do it. Even though like Size 9 was more New York house kind of sound, where Wings or Wing was more minimal house and techno. Well, it seems to be another theme a lot, which is marketing. Having a talk here with Tojo coming in the car was, how do I get to do what you're doing? And I said, gosh, in my head, I'm thinking, it's like, God, it must be so hard to start out nowadays because back in the day, there was like, you know, two new artists, now it's 200 new artists. How can I stand out? How am I unique? What do I do that's different than 2,000 other people that are doing the same thing. I'm not beating the old man up here by saying things have changed, but things have changed, and things have changed quickly. So I have a company that handles my press, solely press. They do interviews and work stuff out, like organizing this and management, and then social media management as well. Because I, you know, believe it or not, I don't, I don't do Facebook. I pay a company to do the Facebook management and record label management for digital media. I said, I don't want to be that guy that just takes pictures of, gives the camera to the promoter or tour manager, which I don't have, but someone behind me with my hands up at a gig or the crowd's going like this. You know, I'm not that kind of guy, so have someone else do it for me. But it's important nowadays, unfortunately. Artists get booked by metadata now. <laughs> That's about, it used to be about music, but it's about metadata. How many friends I had on Facebook when Facebook was popular would guarantee me getting booked at a festival. <laughs> It sucks, but it's true. And it's come to a point where talent does not sell tickets. You have someone who's very talented and doesn't mean that they're gonna pack a club or a venue so they don't get booked a lot. And it's really quite frustrating because there's a lot of talented people out there that don't have a lot of followers. But uh, it's, it's a part of the culture now. Um, the fact that I am expected now as an artist once I get booked for a festival or a club to do promotion on my social media. I didn't know that was part of the game now, but it is. I like aspects of it. I mean, I, I arrived here in Delhi yesterday and I immediately wanted, genuinely wanted to do social media. That's the difference. Like I wanted to take a picture of me with the, on the plane landing and in the plane saying Delhi and put it on social media, or at one o'clock last night when I checked into the hotel, I wanted to eat a yellow doll. Because I'm a fucking idiot. And I wanted people around the world to know that. Um, those are the social media pictures I take. I'm proud of where I'm going, I'm proud of what I do. I want to show you guys off to the world as I do every other special place I've, I've come to. Uh, but. That's what I want to do, even though I'm expected to do it, but marketing and metadata and promotion and management and PR is part of the game. Um, well, thank you for knowing 25 years. The key to success with running a record label of 25 years is losing a lot of money. <laughs> if you want to lose money, start a regular label. 
Um, unfortunately, so it's become a, a labor of love. A lot of my, a lot of my budget from what I get from touring, DJing goes into the maintenance of having a record company. But not being a wise ass answer to your question, um, it's a labor of love and it's about integrity. And I think putting out music that really resonates with our hearts rather than resonate with how successful a record is going to be because of its sound helps the record label for us be what it is because we try not to put out trendy music which has time constraints the trends are related on time and there's a lot of music you can listen to and hear now like an older record here <laughs> uh, that's so 2005 you know and we're fortunate on over to have what we call kind of classical timeless music where it it doesn't get labeled on a certain sound um, that's also difficult with sales because people don't necessarily buy non-trendy music as popular as trendy music or and i don't mean trendy in a bad way too i mean it's very subjective on what is music and trendy and quality it's all different for each of you um but the integrity to signing music that resonates with our hearts rather than realizing that you know i've turned out a lot of records that were really good feed possibility record because it's not we're not the right label for it even though it was huge it could be massive it just didn't fit right and it's not fair to the artists and it's not fair to us to release music that we don't feel comfortable with and no but then again we also release really good music that doesn't sell <laughs> hence if you want to start a record company that you're in like get ready to lose some money you know, it also doesn't cost as much money to run a record label as it did in the past. But we still release vinyl, and I still employ uh, one person. And, uh, you know, we still, a good record for us sells 300 copies, you know, which is a good vinyl release nowadays, which sucks, you know. 300 is the amount of promos that we used to send out. Now it's our top sales. It's ridiculous. So, um, yeah, it's a labor of love and it's a battle with integrity. But if it's something that you like and you want to get involved with, I would say do it. Yeah, you don't collaborate. <laughs> or, or if you do, you realize it's a democracy. Uh, and the good thing, I watched a little documentary today on the two guys that created the movie, uh, the music for The Stranger Things on Netflix. And they just said it so eloquently. We work together, we work separately, we work on something and then we give it to the other person and the other person works on it and I give it to the other person, you know. They have a symbiotic relationship and it, well, things work out really well when it's symbiotic when you need each other and you feed off each other to get the best product that you can. And that's great when it happens and it works. Uh, I'm so used to doing things on my own that it, I'm not saying I don't want to do that. It's just balancing the time in my life to work with someone. It's hard enough for me to get in the studio myself rather than it is to work with someone else. But I am doing a sub project right now under a, a different name. Um, which is down tempo, down tempo electronic soul, and I'm working with uh, another. I, I do the I do the tracks, and then I bring the stems into a friend of mine who's an engineer, and he he's really good at what he does, and he tightens it up and makes it sound good, and then adds his input, and then we work with uh, different vocalists, and then it just seems to work out. But trying to get in the studio, like. I was home last week and I had four days available. And he's an engineer for hire, so that's how he makes his money. He works at the Apple store in Philadelphia, but on the side, he's a true musician engineer. 
does pop music and he's really good at it. But uh, I said, so what's your schedule like? And he's like, uh, maybe Tuesday. So Tuesday comes around, I text him in the morning. And I was like, how about today? And I don't hear back from him until 10 at night. Okay. You know, but that's working with someone else. We get bombarded with a lot of music. I try to listen to demos, and even that is kind of hard to find the time. But it's an equal process between myself and uh, a friend of mine, Matt Brookman, who's been running the record label with me since not the beginning, but I think he's five years. I think he's been with Bobo for 20 years, and he. He's, he, bring things, he brings things to me that I like, and I bring things to him. The stuff that I bring to him, like from people giving me USB keys at the clubs or sending me links online, he brings a reality to me because a lot of people that give me music, give me music that kind of sounds like me, which is cool. So I, I send Matt the, the track and I say, yeah, dude, dude, I got this really cool track. And he's like, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, I agree it's a perfectly cool, it's a cool track, but it sounds like someone trying to be you. And I never thought of it like that. I just thought it was a cool track. So it's, he's like, I don't know if we should sign it because people want you, not people trying to sound like you. And I said, wow, I've never thought of it that way. So and that and and our relationship that works well between us is that he brings me down to reality, I bring him down to reality. Sometimes it's a mistake and sometimes it's conscious of what we put out. There's always something new. There's always someone coming about. And there's always something changing. The most unchanging thing in our life is change. It's just our DNA. It's a very fickle industry that we're in, and there's a lot of artists that came out five years ago, two years ago, seven years ago, that were very big and popular that aren't around anymore. Or they're doing completely different sounding things. I'm friends with Tiesto. He came up to me years ago and said, I used to work in the record store when your music was popular, and that's, I like your music also because of my history in Holland and listening and working at a, re re a record store that sold techno in house. So, uh, something that I, I'm not too familiar with this music, but I took it as a nice compliment, especially because of the size and demeanor of who Tiesto is. Um, but his music, I mean, I know him as a trance artist. He was a trance artist. I don't know too much of what he's playing now, but I know he's changed. So you ask yourself the question, why would he change? It kind of answers a little bit of your question as well. Uh, obviously, I, I don't know, he's not here and I can't speak on behalf of him. There was a reason why he changed whether it was marketing or whether it's not him, him being, um, that was his integrity is he got inspired by certain music. Uh, my friend Ali Dubfire, who runs SciTech Records, I mean, he was half a deep dish and I grew up being friends and knowing him and Shram. I mean, two Persian guys making cool house music. And then, Ali goes techno and minimal. Why? You know, he got inspired and he had a great team behind him and he made it work. You know, so it's up to the individual and, and their integrity on why they change sounds um, and push, maybe they're pushing themselves. Maybe they got to a creative end in their career where they're just like, I don't like where I'm going, I want to do something else. Like I said before, you know, when something feels comfortable, you may want to throw a wrench in there and do something uncomfortable to see how it feels, to help out and see if you truly may like it. I 
I wish I was just a festival artist playing daytime festivals where I would play three to five and then I'd have the rest of the day to do whatever I wanted. But I, tonight is early. Tonight finishes at 12 for me. But then, then there's the basement. And you have to ask yourself the question is, do I want to go to the basement? <laughs> You know, Deb asked me, like, how's the gen life? How do you feel? You know, I just arrived yesterday. It took me, like, 15 and a half hours to get here. And a nine and a half hour time zone difference. Um, I said something driving here, which was, I love my job. I don't like my work. If you get that, then you got it. When I perform, I am in bliss. I am a pig in shit. I, that's all I want to do. Two hours, one hour, five hours, 17 hours, that's just what I love doing. But getting there and leaving, that's what I get paid for. That's my work. The physical, the mental, that's where it becomes taxed. The no sleep, the jet lag, the artificial atmospheres of airplane travel, but constant traveling touring artists. It's big. And most people, I didn't see the documentary on Avicii. Supposedly it's really good, but supposedly he like toured 300 and what, 40 days a year or something like that, had 400 gigs or something. I, it's just mind blowing. I mean, yes, he was young and the body is more resilient than can deal with things like that, but I have been doing this 20 some years and it becomes difficult to balance. And that's the key to life for me, it's always been a balance. Um, am I worth it to take care of myself? Are we worth it to take care of ourselves? That's a question I have to ask. You know, some artists, they don't know and they don't care, they just want to be up on stage performing and they want to be drunk and they want to be high and they want to escape and that works well for them and the way they deal with no sleep is by doing more coke or something like that um for me it's important to have a balance of everything even though i beat myself up with this crazy schedules i mean uh, a friend of mine in philadelphia says dude you're going to india man that's fucking insane you should be Oh man, I wish I was going to India. And I said, my immediate thing is like, I'm happy to be here, but I'm gonna be away three days, three cities, in a five days of travel. And when I looked at it, I'm like, shit, that's a lot of work. And then someone said, well, why didn't you stay in Mumbai for an extra day? And it's a good question. It's the balance, is being able to realize if you're good enough, if you're worth enough to yourself to be able to take care of yourself. And a lot of this industry is very difficult on the body and the mind. So I try to do things in my life to balance. So we have to ask ourselves time management and what's important for ourselves. But it is important in this industry to take care of yourself if you want to take care of yourself. I like alcohol. I don't get drunk. For me, that's a big difference. I like music. That's what gets me high. I don't do drugs. I love food, but I'm a vegan. That's what makes me happy. Certain things that we do in our lives make us who we are and make us work well. And sometimes we're able to see it and sometimes we're not. And self-reflection has a lot to do. I like my mind. So I meditate. That's what makes me meditate. Is that friend of mine? I'm also very imperfect and <laughs> like everybody else. Uh, but it's a very good question. A lot of people talk about it because in the industry we see the party, the escape, and there's also the other side of escape, which is reality. It's a big conscious decision to me to be aware and as conscious as I can of mental and physical. We have one body, one mind, and it's how you live your life in your shell that makes and defines who you are. So this works for me.